All right, it is 7.01 on Monday night, the 7th of February. I'd like to call the meeting to order. If we could all please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight we have myself, First Select Woman Tara Carr, and Selectman Harry Shaker present. It's my understanding that uh, Selectman Steve Dunn is not available this evening. Is that correct? He's not on or anything? That's correct. He's not okay. available. And I just want to remind everyone that public comment will be at the end and that we are limiting our public comment to three minutes. The first items on the agenda for this evening will be our presentations. So I'd like to welcome um, Greg Dembowski, our town project man manager, to the podium. And thank you for being here tonight, Greg. Thank you very much for inviting me. I do have handouts, uh, extra copies here. for the people at the front table. Can I just pass them off? Do you have one, right? Yes. I imagine you have one. Yes. This one's a little larger than the one in Jenny our one for you. And that makes all of these experts for anybody that would like to stop part Just a little larger yeah. print. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Okay. okay, I believe Jenny's gonna be my page turner this evening. I don't have a clicker because this is not a this is not a PowerPoint. So let me start by just um, on the first page, Jenny. We'll yes. <laughs> kind of slow. Am I in the way, Greg? You could probably. We should probably have to okay. kind of move. Greg, am I in the way here? Nope. No, I mean, okay. We good? We good to go? Yes. Okay. So, uh, at Terra's request, and I think many of you have heard me talk about the town center district on and off over the past few years, she asked that I paint a picture of how we got here. So I'll be talking about the past before we get to the present and the future. My first opening comment is there's a lot here. This is not just about streetscape. This is about a lot of different things going on, all of which overlap on what we're talking about in our town center district. So I'll be covering many topics, but I'll be brief on any of them. If the board has any questions, stop me and we'll dig into more detail. Okay, got any next page please? So we're gonna start with the past, just on three slides. And I go way back to 2009. This is an article in the News Times, and it's about the opening of the Route 7 bypass. And on the bottom of that page is a picture of Governor Rell with Boughton and many other legislators uh, opening up that Route 7 bypass. Why do I start here? Because many people say that was really an acceleration of our downtown really um, being underdeveloped. Businesses started shutting down. There was a lot less traffic, tens of thousands of fewer cars a day going up and down our downtown. And with the opening of that bypass, which was talked about for decades before, when it opened in 2009, things really started to slow down in our downtown. Next page, Jenny. So what do we do about it? Well, within the next couple years, over the next couple years, we started, we hired a couple of consultants. One of them was Malone, uh, Fitzgerald and Halliday and Forward Planning, who did a housing study. And their objective was to come up with a revitalization plan for our downtown. This is the report that was issued in, I think the date there was 2012. And there was a committee, there was a steering committee of 15 residents all volunteers, some board members on various boards and commissions. They created a vision statement. There was a lot of community input. They studied existing conditions. They did a housing and market study, like I said, by forward planning. They came up with concept plans and an implementation plan. And that plan had many key elements. I listed three here. One called complete streets. We now known as our streetscape design standard. They also recommended zoning regulation changes and cultural and civic enhancements to our downtown. That document, by the way, is on the town website in the Planning Commission's uh, page on the town website. 
Here we are three years later, and as is required in every town in Connecticut, every 10 years we're required to uh, um, come up with, develop, update our plan of conservation and development. That is required by state law, I believe, but it certainly is a requirement when we ask for state grants. A very common question is, is it in your POCD? Is it a priority for your town? A very common question in grant applications. So that's our 2015 POCD. And on the bottom of that page, if you can scroll down a bit, I just have one quote. The Four Corners Town Center Revitalization Plan represents, and I won't read the rest. Going back to 2002, we were talking about revitalizing our downtown. This 2015 POCD talks about still needing to do that. 20 years ago. So let's move on to the present. That's a little bit of history real quick. I want to talk a little bit about zoning before I get into many other things. The first thing I want to mention is that Brookfield has 16 zoning districts. Seven are commercial, six are residential, and three are industrial. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about four commercial zones tonight. Those four zones in total are equal in land mass relatively speaking, to all the industrial zones in town. So, zoning. Before 2010, our downtown was called the Village Business District. And it was renamed the TCD in 2010 with not many changes made to the regulations, basically just a, a renaming. In 2018, there was a task force appointed and a consultant was hired to basically rewrite our entire, entire zoning regulation book. There were a lot of inconsistencies, there were overlaps, there was redundancies, there was just a lot that needed to get done, and the Zoning Commission adopted those regulations in December of 2018. Two zones were created in what's now our downtown with those regulation changes, and they were the Gateway North and Gateway South, leading into the Town Center District and their purpose was to provide an orderly transition coming into a downtown area. I'll talk about that more on the next slide. Also in 2000, or then in 2020, we changed the zoning regs again, and we adopted the streetscape, sidewalk, and amenity specifications. They were required to be codified by the DOT because of all the money we were asking the state to spend in our downtown on a state road. After streetscape phase one, where we got a, about a million dollars of lots of money, the DOT said, wait a minute. You're asking for all this state money for all these future phases, but where is it, where, where is it in your codes? Well, it wasn't there. So we were required to put that in our zoning regs back in 2020. The zoning regulations also talk about blighted buildings and properties. But the, but the zoning commission has very limited authority in that regard. So over the past few years, town ordinances were uh, amended, and you can read chapter 83, and it defines legislative authority and describes enforcement powers and other remedies that now exist in the town charter. And one of the things that came to be was called the Blight Panel, which now meets regularly on issues of blight townwide. So that's a little bit about zoning. Next page, Jenny, please. This is the first time you're gonna see, well, this, you're gonna see this map many times with different overlays. But on this one, I just point out um, where the TCD is. Jenny, if you can scroll up just a bit. There's a lot on this map, um, by the way. And there's a line, well, hard to get on one page, I know, that's good. So the TCD is right in the heart of the Four Corners area. You can see where I've penciled in phases one and two, which were completed over the past four or five years. So the TCD, when we talk about our downtown, people think about the Four Corners area. But the town center district, as defined in our regulations, is actually 1.3 miles long. To the north of that, we have Gateway North. It's 0.7 miles long. And to the south of that, we have Gateway South, about a half mile long. And on that map in your packages, I have the line that shows the separation between the TCD zone and the north and south gateways. We also have a perimeter zone on Laurel Hill Road called TCD Perimeter. 
So that's a, that map you're going to see uh, with different uh, layers on it over the next uh, half, you know, 20 minutes or so. But that's kind of give you some orientation as to what you'll be seeing coming up here. Next page, Jenny, please. So, um, back down a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about housing. Subject of a lot of conversation, especially when we talk about affordable and incentive housing. So just a little background. Since 1988, there's been 20 public acts of the state legislature and two blue ribbon commissions that have created legislation about affordable incentive housing. I'm not gonna go through any bit of that tonight, but there is a very nice summary of those 20 public acts. I can email to anybody who's interested. Recent, as recently as six months ago, I guess that's seven months ago now, the first statewide effort reversing local control over zoning standards came to be. It's Public Act 2119. You can read through that, but I, I have four highlights here. It creates uniform standards for accessory dwelling units. It alters the calculation for the number of dwelling units. It establishes minimum training requirements for planning and zoning commissioners, several of which are in this room this evening and maybe on the phone. And provides for floating overlay zones in planned development districts. So that's the uh, 20th of 20 public acts. A lot to absorb, and for those on planning and zoning commissions, it's matters that we're getting very um, um, educated about for reasons I'll talk about later in the presentation. We also eliminated two zones in July of 2021, or the regulations did, because we did, the, the town did not receive what's called incentive housing zone credits back many years ago. And for that reason, and because we were required to increase affordable housing, we eliminated the incentive housing zone. Um, and with that, uh, we uh, eliminated two other districts. Uh, now that we have this TCD, and I've listed them, there, them now, those crazy acronyms, R-H-O-W and I-H-D. The last thing I'll talk about when it comes to regulation is a state statute 830J. It now requires each town to submit an affordable housing plan each five years, and ours is due on June 1st and here in a few months. Uh, just like the PLCD that's due every 10 years, we now have to submit affordable housing plans every five years by uh, public act. Luckily, WESCOG has provided outstanding guidelines and elements that we must include in the plan, and we're working on our draft now. I've made two pleasant presentations to the Planning Commission about this with our draft plan, and I'll be presenting it to the Zoning Commission here Thursday night. We have a lot of work yet to do in that regard. So that's just an overlay on affordable incentive housing. I should also make it clear that not all of our affordable and incentive housing is in our four downtown zones. It's, it's spread across the town. It's primarily in those four districts, but not exclusively. Next slide, Jenny. So, selected housing statistics. So why do I put these up here and why is it relevant to today? I, there, there is tons of information about housing. I dissected and analyzed and put in bar charts comparing Brookfield to local towns to the rest of the state and national averages. You can read about this stuff until your, until your head spins. I've hit a few statistics here, and I'll talk about why they're here when I talk about moratoriums on the bottom of this page. So without reading through all this, I'll just hit a couple highlights. The average size of a Brookfield uh, household has been de declining over the, decreasing over the past 30 years. Brookfield has the third largest percentage increase in housing units in the region over the last 50 years from 3,100 to about 7,100 over those 30 years, or 50 years, sorry. Half of the housing units constructed from 2010 to 2017 were multifamily. 84% of our housing units are owner-occupied, 16% renter-occupied. There's the breakdown of housing structures, one unit versus 20 units or more. And an important point here is that even though the 2020 national census statistics have been released, the housing 
demographics have not been uploaded by the Department of Housing's, uh, what they call their um, appeals list. The Department of Housing has an appeals list. It's the housing by town. When that is updated, the calculations that go into what percent we have in affordable incentive is going to get updated. I'd imagine our housing units are going to go up, which means the percentages we have for affordable and incentive are going to go down if no new units were added. And that's going to be important when I get to these bottom two points. So Jenny, if you can move the page up, please. So there's currently two moratoriums that we're working on or talk about in the land use office and certainly with the Board of Selectmen. And the first is, and it's not a new story, we're trying to extend our affordable housing moratorium. It expired in July. We've made three attempts since last April to extend that moratorium. We've been denied three times. The last denial was in December, two months ago. And um, there's reasons, well, the, the reasons for that denial are things that we're overcoming and I'm working with Tara on and I'll talk about in his presentation later, uh, later when I get to recommendations. When the word moratorium comes up, there's also conversation and concern about the WPCA sewer moratorium that went into effect on January 1st. So, our inventory of affordable housing is increased from 1.85% in 2010 to 5.62% based on the 2010 census in 2020. That number is going to go down when the housing units get uploaded in the Department of Housing database. And with the sewer moratorium, um, I'll speak on behalf of Nelson who's here and you can certainly add more to this than I. Two reasons why that moratorium is in place and I have them listed here and I'll let Nelson answer any more questions about this. Um, there's there's been, uh, the moratorium has placed limits on the primary, primarily impacted on large housing development applications. Those that have not been approved or submitted as of January 1st. And who's, and, and who, what's not going to be as impacted, amp, impacted are commercial developments or single family homes. The way the, the way the moratorium was set up and the limits they put in place, again, will primarily impact large housing development applications. So, you know, those are the two mor moratorium efforts that are, or actions or issues that are in front of us, uh, and those of course are uh, town-wide, but certainly hit the TCD. Next page, Jenny, please. Now on this slide, if you turn your head a little bit to the right, that top line levels out nicely. That was good. <laughs> man, no, man, there's a serious crowd here. Okay, so, um, what's the title of the slide, Jenny? Can you just scroll down there? future streetscape phases. So now you can roll up and put that cross of the of our four corners area right in the middle. So I took a little bit higher, Jenny, thanks. So phases one and two are done. We talked about that. Phase three construction starts April 1st in three months. And what's coming next, at least what we have approved through West Cog, are phases four and five. Phase six has not yet been approved to send to the Board of Finance for approval. And we'll talk about that tonight and the importance of, or, or the role phase six plays in our downtown. So those are the six phases of streetscape as we, uh, as we talk about them today. Next page, Jenny, please. Now, way too many numbers to talk about, but for those that have ever heard me talk about streetscape, this is a comparison of all six phases. And this is basically um, a take on the the different items that each phase brings in. Linear feet of sidewalk, number of crosswalks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what's really important is the bottom half of that page and its funding source. And if you can scroll down just a bit, Jenny, thanks. Uh, funding sources over these six phases have really changed over time. Phase one, you remember, way back in the mid 2010s, 20 teens, it took us forever to get that first phase in. It took four sources of funds, town money, steep, low SIP, and lot SIP. And the town's contribution was about $1.6 million on a $3.5 million project. If you go across for the next phases, look how much more efficient we've gotten on spending state money. I say that with a joke. 
And really now, on the later phases, we're spending 400000 or less on each phase, with the rest all coming from LOTSIP. We've had tremendous success understanding the LOTSIP program and jumping on grant opportunities when they came up, sometimes with very short notice and deadlines. So when all six phases are complete, as I showed on the graph, we will spend $14 million. The town's contribution would have been $3.5 million, and 1.6 of it, more than half of it, took us to get us off the ground with phase one. And then I have some metrics on the bottom and reasons why one phase is so much more expensive or cheaper than another, but I won't get into that unless anybody wants to stop with the question. And there are big differences on why the per linear foot price is so different phase to phase. It's actually pretty interesting, but maybe not for tonight. Again, call if you have any questions. Next page, Jim. So, a little bit about LOTSIP. LOTSIP is a Connecticut DOT program, and it is very uh, effective and efficient on spending state money, m so much more than federal grants. It gives the town a lot of leadway, um, but this document, which is about 120 pages long, is the Bible. Anytime you want to submit a grant, when a solicitation opens, you have to know what you can solicit, uh, su submit for, what the qualifiers are, who's eligible, what's eligible, what's not, how you get a cost proposal, on and on and on, how you get reimbursement, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the guiding document for any lots of state-funded programs. I think it's about 50 to 60 million bucks a year Hartford gets from the Federal Highway Administration, and that is, that, that is those funds relocated to local transportation capital improvements. Next page, Jenny. So, sorry, this is way too busy and we're not going to read it, but this is an attempt to talk about the development that's happened in the four districts I talked about, the TCD, the perimeter zone, and both gateway zones. So the top box talks about five things that have been completed since we announced the construction of phase one in the years they were put in. Of course, it's Brookfield Village, all four buildings. It's Laurel Hill Residence, and it's the Still River Greenway Trail that would have started up regardless of streetscape, but nonetheless did start up after phase one was in the ground. And then on the bottom of this page, and this kind of goes on for the rest of the page, are things that are coming in these four zones. I have the street address, I have the name of the development, I have the number of incentive or uh, market rate apartments, um, I have any issues or status, um, and I talk about the, the kinds of things that are coming. Other than the hundreds of apartments that are listed here, there's also a Latin restaurant, a sushi restaurant, a medical center, uh, and many other things besides apartments. One thing I'll point out is what, we, what we've been calling a pocket park, and I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. The last column on this page are alphabets, A through O, or A through whatever, and those are map keys that identify the locations of all these on the next page. Jenny, if you can roll it. So on that same map are the A, are the, all the, is the alphabet soup and the location for all of these developments that are planned. Now I do have to stop and make this point because it is very important. And it's true of many of these larger projects. And I can give you a couple of very recent examples. Just because a project is approved by the land use departments and has all their permits, doesn't mean it's going to get built. I'll take as, as an example the Enclave. And I wish, I wish Tony Lucero was here because he's a developer. And Tony knows I'd be using his example tonight at this meeting. But he's actually in Aruba on vacation. So Tony, if you're listening, have a margarita for us. <laughs> but let me give the example of the Enclave. It's been approved for many, many, many years. In fact, their permits had to get extended. So even though it showed in our plans as 181, apart 181 apartments, 20% incentive, it hasn't been built. And finally, over the past couple months, we've been saying to Tony, Tony, if this thing doesn't come to be, we're not going to do streetscape phase four. We're just not going to do it. We can't build a sidewalk to nowhere. We can't skip over this large development to get to Newberry Village. The state won't allow it. It won't let you build a sidewalk, stop, and have another section of sidewalk. It's got to all connect. So over the past two weeks, Tony finally said, you know, 
I can't, I just, for reasons I won't get into here, he goes, I just can't pull this project together. He came to us last week and said, I'm going to cut it in half. I'm only going to take half the number of parcels, that, I'm going to take the parcel that I own, and I'm going to put in 91 apartments. So that project got cut in half from 181 to 91, even though he's approved for the bigger number, probably six or eight or 10 years ago. That's only one example. So what I'm saying here is, this is what the plans are as we know them today. Some may never happen, and some may come up over the next year or two that we don't even know about. You know, a developer at any time can take any one of those parcels and develop it as long as it meets the current zoning regulations. So that's a map of what we know it as we know it today in our four districts. Next page, Jim, please. Maintenance. We have this beautiful downtown now. How do we maintain all that sidewalk? Well, that, the maintenance of our downtown now is authorized by two directives. One is our master municipal agreement with the DOT that we were required to sign when we started Streetscape. And one is our town ordinances where the police have uh, enforcement um, uh, responsibility. And then the responsibility to do, to do certain things vary. Property owners are responsible for shoveling their snow in front of their sidewalks. The DOT is responsible for clearing the roadway on Route 25 and 202. And then we have the town's Department of Public Works, Park and Rec, many of which are here to play a very key role. Those are the things they do. And on the bottom are the things that come out of uh, the Development Office and the Economic Development Commission. So that is how we maintain our beautiful new downtown with these regulations and agreements with the state. Next page. Okay, Pocket Park, we're gonna switch gears a bit. And if you can't turn that page sideways, you can't turn your head 90 degrees. But here is, uh, can you go just a little bit, Jenny? You wanna go down. Okay, that's good, yeah, that's good. So what you're looking at is the intersection of old Route 7 and Federal Road. And to the right is the new Duncan, and what's soon to be the new Portobello. That grassy area in front. Kind of the entrance way into our downtown. We've been trying for, coming up on a year, to have the DOT let us put a pocket park, a small park there, to kind of give some greenery and a welcoming, not all concrete and steel, uh, um, you know, into our downtown to liven it up a bit, and to connect the Still River Greenway to our sidewalks. And because that, most of that land is owned by the DOT, they've been very restrictive. In fact, we've been told no on what we wanted to do on and off over the past several years. We finally came to agreement, maybe about a month, month and a half ago, that with some stipulations, they're gonna allow us to put the pocket park in as a change order on Streetscape Phase 3, funded 100% with lots of money. So that's good news. The rub is, at this point, we can't put in the art sculpture. Um, it's one of the stipulations for putting this in now, but we could with the future encroachment permit. So, crossing my fingers, um, and I think we're 95% we're there. By the end of this summer, not only will Streetscape Phase 3 be done, but we're gonna have a beautiful, small, but beautiful park there, greenery with trees, benches, um, all granite curbing, a uh, little, little, little park uh, entranceway into our downtown. I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Next page, Jenny. Still River Greenway Trail. Okay, we all, it's, uh, it's been a great success for this town. It's designated as a Connecticut Greenway by the Greenways Council and is one of the most used trails in the entire state. And uh, the people here that have made that happen should be commended for years and years and maybe decades of work to get that in. So, um, phase one of the trail uh, was opened in 2017 and there's always been plans to extend it north and south to connect our Greenway to New Milford and into Danbury. It's an objective of the Connecticut Trail Council to connect greenways. If you open up the Greenway map for the state, you'll see trails all over the state, not all are connected. They're trying to connect trails. So we applied for three grants in the middle of last year, and we just learned only last week that the third, we were denied for the third of three. For various reasons, uh, these are highly competitive grants, not a lot of money, and we put our best foot forward, but did not get any of those grants. So, for that reason, um, 
for us to extend the trail, the easiest way to do that now would be with lots of money. This is an eligible expense in what I call streetscape phase six, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But generally speaking, funding is available for construction for trails, not so much for design and engineering. Lots of particularly requires that any design work comes out of town funding. Lots of pays for construction and right away acquisition and inspection services. So knowing what pockets of money provide what is kind of part of the puzzle on this whole thing. So it's my opinion, and I think the opinion of the park and rec people that are here, that the most practical and lowest cost route to extend the Still River Greenway North is via Streetscape Phase 6. Well, I've looked at, and I think Jay and others have looked at, every other possible option that's even remotely feasible. Some are not, because they all, it has to be ADA compliant. And I've come to the conclusion, and that is a primary reason why Streetscape Phase 6 um, was submitted as an application, was to get our Still River Greenway going north. So on the next page is another map. And this is the, in my mind, the most feasible, and not just mine, but others in this room, the most feasible route to get us to the new Milford line. And in that little box on the bottom half of this page are the, are the eight or nine different steps. Streetscape phase six gets us north of Station Road, right to the, where, the, the number, Sorry. where the number four uh, is. And then through a series of right-of-way acquisitions with developers, some of which we've already been granted those easements, others not yet. And then going along the Still River, I think is the most practical way for us to get to New Milford and extend the Still River Greenway. Next year. So, what is Streetscape Phase Six? It is four million dollars, all of which two hundred and five thousand will come from town funds. The rest from Lotsip. The reason why this request, updated in January of 2020, is 140, 150 thousand dollars higher than what I presented to the Board of Selectmen several months ago, is because we lost a year. And it's, that's 5% inflation on that kind of money. So the request now is basically 150 grand more than I presented to the Board of Selectmen um, probably the fall of last year, and to the Board of Finance, by the way. That's a preliminary design. Notice the 10% contingency, $318,000. At this early of a phase in the project and preliminary design, your contingencies are always higher. As we get the final design, that contingency goes down to nothing in the final design as we go out to bid. So that's Streetscape Phase 6. Now we're into recommendations and steps forward. And I think there's nine. So my first recommendation tonight is that the town accept the DOT's offer to include a Streetscape Phase 3, the pocket park. As I say there, it'll all be picked up with a supplemental uh, project authorization letter from Conduct. I have that in writing. And a note to the Arts Commission or anybody interested in what's going to go in that beautiful park. We are making accommodations or leaving room for a future art sculpture of some piece. But the state told us you must meet the, st uh, the state's public art guidelines. And those have been sent to the Arts Commission. My second recommendation, which is a no-brainer, is that we finish Streetscape Phase 3. Uh, submittals are already in. Contractors buying materials. We start construction in April. Phase 4. There's Tony Lucera. That's the enclave. Now that Tony is going to submit a zoning permit modification, once that's been submitted to the zoning commission, the zoning commission accepts it, probably with the public hearing. Once that's approved by zoning, we now have a green light to finalize our phase four design, which will allow us to take the Still River, I'm sorry, the Streetscape project, with, which ends at the Agora restaurant, all the way to Newberry Village. And all the amenities on that project are back on the Streetscape Phase 4 column that shows about all the things coming in. It's a large phase. It'll be very complex. But when done, it's going to look like the rest of our downtown. Uh, so that's Streetscape Phase 4. Phase 5. This, is this, this gets us a sidewalk to the new grocery store. You're probably saying, what grocery store? They cleared all those woods. 
they you know cleared they cut all the trees all the fill dirts there and uh, it's Tony, not, not Tony, it's, yeah, it's Tony and, um, and Paul Scalzo, they still don't have their OSTA approval for their driveway cut. There's a big debate going on, really a negotiation, on is there going to be new traffic light or just turning lanes coming into that grocery store, which, by the way, is now also an Ace Hardware uh, parking lot for the Still River Greenway, and I think 16 or so apartments. So that project's grown in scope over the years. So once the DOT, once we hear that the DOTs approve their um, OSTA permit for the driveway cut, we can design a beautiful crosswalk and intersection for people to walk from basically Laurel Hill Road, cross the street in a safe way to the grocery store. That's phase five. Streetscape phase fit six. There's two ways we can go with this. Um, and the way I, after thinking and, and, and talking to uh, people today, I think because this really is our last phase, and I believe it's getting to be budget time on capital projects, it may make more sense, instead of going to the Board of Finance now, include phase six as part of the capital plan for the upcoming referendum, if you will, on budget. That, to me, would fit in nicely, and it allows us to focus on phases three, four, and five. That'll be about a three or so month delay in the schedule. That may cost us a construction year, maybe not. And um, if the DOT allows us, we're already past due on the, on the deadlines to submit information. I'll, I'll call them first thing tomorrow, and I'll ask them if they can give us another three months on the schedule. So I think that's my recommendation for phase six. Let's get it part of the capital plan and make sure it fits into the town's priorities for how we want to spend capital. So I know there's a lot of demands that uh, are coming to the board for our capital expenditures. But again, the in my mind, the primary purpose of phase six is a still river greenway extension. Up, which was number six. And I believe the ARPA uh, task force is gonna talk about uh, funding and maybe some allocation for our trail uh, extension study. I believe their study called for, or their recommendations include a quarter million dollars that was the original grant amount to study the extension north to New Milford and south to Danbury. The more, the, the, um, the more urgent, or the, the one that's more, um, I think, pressing, more uh, realistic in a short time, is focusing on the trail north. Taking that trail to Danbury has got a lot of hurdles. And we can study that now, but given the limited resources, I'm going to suggest to ARPA and to the board that we cut that request from 250 down to 125 and just focus on the study going from downtown to New Milford. And I think that'll take us enough years as is. So that's um, Still River Greenway. Affordable housing moratorium. Um, I've talked to Tara several times on this, and there's two items that we're required to submit that we, uh, reasons for denial. One of them is, and it's something we don't have in place, is we're required to have policies and procedures on how we manage the affordable housing inventory. And we don't have those in place. And they, the state told us, we're not gonna give you a moratorium until the town certifies policies and procedures. And we're working on that now. And that's, that's a rather important item, and that's getting a lot of uh, attention in the land use office. The last thing, no, second last thing, affordable housing plan is due to the state on June 1st, and I'll be meeting with zoning and have a draft for this board to review, I hope sometime in April, and you'll see our affordable housing plan. And lastly, um, we need to, we, the land use office, needs to keep working closely with the Land Use Commissions and the WPCA. As regulations change, uh, public acts change, as the change happens with developers and the landscape of what comes in and what people want to do, we've really got to keep our eye on underdeveloped parcels and make sure we're all talking to each other, we're all on the same page as we plan our downtown going forward. That is the end of my presentation. Any right. questions? Yeah, Greg, thank you very much, um, not only for this, for all the work you do for, 
for the residents here and for the town. I have a question as far as Tony in the enclave with the application for a uh, zoning permit or for a permit. Um, how does this come into play with the current moratorium on uh, applications? Tony's is incentive, not affordable. So Tony's, um, any project that's been approved, even incentive or affordable, regardless of a moratorium or a plan, if they've already been approved, they've been grandfathered. But in Tony's case, it's 20% incentive. Very different than affordable housing. Very different. The definition of affordable housing and the state statutes what require it are different than the incentive housing standards. And if this board would like a presentation or an update or any information, I've got some here. It's a lot of detail, it's a lot of numbers, but understanding what affordable housing is as defined by the state and what's required to meet affordable housing standards is not only changing, but it's rather complex, to be honest with you. Yeah, I do have, I have a couple other questions, but I'd rather just, to, I'd rather than take up time tonight, I, I'll give you a call. Stop on in, Harry. Stop on in. I do have a couple of, of things to, to add, if you don't mind, Greg, and I do want to thank you so much. This was so thorough, and I, I, I think that it's really, really, really important, and it's important to not only understand, again, where we are right now and where we've come from, but where we're headed. And... Um, I think you've done a great job of setting the stage for, for what Colette's going to be presenting um, when we're done here. But um, if, if everybody could just take a quick look at their page 13. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, the state of Connecticut calls for 10% affordable. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, we're at 5.62% here in Brookfield. That's going to change in a couple of months because of the uh, 2020 housing data that when it gets uploaded by the Department of Housing that housing denominator is going to increase, so that 5.62 is going to decrease. Okay. I'll be in about two months. All right. With no change in actual affordable housing units, the calculation changes. So from what we've talked about in the past, there's 18 towns in our COG, mm -hmm. And we're the fifth highest percentage of affordable, sitting at 5.62 right now. Is that right? Yeah. It, I, actually, it was just amazing to me. I pulled out a table in the, from West Cog. Out of the 18 towns in our Cog, the one, the town with the highest number of affordable units is Danbury at 12. Danbury at 12. I'm sorry. Let me go backwards. Stamford, 15.65 percent. Norwalk, 13.5 uh, percent. Danbury, 12 percent. Three big towns in our Cog. Bethel, 6.28%. Next is Brookfield, 5.62. The other 13 towns in our COG are less than Brookfield. We've come a long way in those 10 years, and this moratorium is really that, and with the sewer moratorium, and with all of this in front of us in our four corners, it's probably time, in my mind, time for a pause, and just sitting back to see, you know, what, what do we have here? Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that that was highlighted. I appreciate that information. And then the second thing that I wanted to highlight um, on page 17 to your uh, future development list here, and, and I just want to remind everybody that this, these, these items here at the bottom are just for the town center district area, so we're not even talking south federal from um, where, 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 uh, where the highway extension is all the way to where a tractor barn used to be. Right. So there's there's a lot more in that corridor as well that's coming down the pike. Um, but if we just concentrate tonight on these items here, that these, these units, I did a, some quick math earlier, it, it totals 478 units. That's That includes one, two, three bedroom plus the condos. So potentially we've got near a thousand people if there's two people per unit. Um, and that, again, does not include the other development across town. So of these on this list, 108 of those units are incentive, and that's 20% of the total development that's expected coming down the pike for the town center district. Um, and and why, do I, why, why do I highlight that? All of this, obviously, is very important to me, and I'm still in the process of learning and trying to absorb it all, but it means a lot to, to Brookfield. It's got... A significant impact that 
I'm just not sure we're ready for at this juncture. And because I'm now fully ensconced in the budget season, it's gonna be really important to understand the impact of what to do with the ARPA money, to understand how we're allocating our money towards our resources. Um, I got some stats today from the fire department for, or from EMS, for example, where um, from 2020, already in 2022, there's been a 34% increase from 2021 in responses. There's been 232 um, EMS 911 calls this year over 163 last year for the same month. So that's just one little example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about how we support our resources, how we're going to be able to respond. And that those numbers I just uh, let you all in on don't include the opening of the Linden, which is set to open within the next few months. So there's just a lot going on and I can't emphasize it enough that um, it all ties together. Um, Greg hit on the blight the Still River Greenway expansion, um, the, the sewer moratorium, which if you all are following my, my updates and my spotlight, you know that I've been meeting with uh, Matt Knickerbocker and Dean Esposito and then Pete Bass up in New Milford. We have major, major concerns in town. And um, you know, this is gonna be helpful, Colette, so I wanna thank your team in advance for all the work that, that you all have done. But it, it it's, um, it's a matter of putting the pieces of the puzzle together, and uh, that's why I, I'm just, I thank you for, for sharing, and we're gonna have to stay on top of what it is that's happening and how we attack it. Thank you, Greg. I don't have anything else. Thanks, Greg. Um, so there are two motions that I'd like to make based off the recommendations that Greg provided us tonight. The first motion is that the selectmen make a motion to attempt to get the Department of Transportation approval to make streetscape phase six to the capital budget for a vote this spring. I'll second that. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say no. All in favor? Majority? I, I, I don't see holding this up right now I, I, I do have questions but I, I don't I don't think we should hold this up right now so yeah this it's one's nice. already yeah. underway yeah. the money's already halfway been yeah. spent and it's 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 the grants are in place and it's a work in progress mm -hmm. it's just a matter of whether we continue it or not and if we want to get that still river greenway going northbound this is our option you got that one Jenny and the second motion based off of um and you approved it and all that yes okay. two zero town center district items is that the selectmen make a motion to approve a change order to streetscape phase three that adds the pocket park with 100 percent of the construction cost for the pocket park to be paid with lots of funding and documented via the supplemental project authorization letter from the connecticut department of transportation i'll second that. any discussion no all in favor aye Okay. Thank you. And without further ado, our next item is. Can I ask a question? No. Okay. Sorry. She, she added that to the agenda. This is the first one. I changed the motion. Thank you, Buck. Thank you. Good evening. Thinking. There we go. There we go. Okay. 
Okay, good evening, everyone. I wanted to start the proposal today by explaining a little bit about the ARPA funding for those who may not be familiar with it. The American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, details $350 billion given to state, local, and tribal governments for the recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of that, $5,023,169.20 has been allocated for Brookfield. These funds must be obligated for purpose by December 31st, 2024, and spent by the end of 2026. Funds must be used for purposes set forth in the Department of Treasury's final rule. Up to a couple weeks ago, we were working on the interim final rule, and since that time, Treasury has released all 437 pages of the final rule. So there are four final rule eligible use categories for use of these funds. I'm going into a little bit of depth for these. The first one is to replace lost public sector revenue. Now the interim final rule allowed municipalities to use lost revenue funds to go straight. Microphone. Dead batteries. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Please. All right. So the um, the interim final rule allowed municipalities to use lost revenue funds directly to support government services. So for government operations, it was based on a calculation. Um, set forth in the interim final rule, and for Brookfield, that amount was $1.9 million. When the final rule came out, it kept that option, but it also added the option of a $10 million standard allowance that a municipality could take, or the amount of the fund, whichever is less. So for all plausible purposes, the town of Brookfield could use the entire amount to provide and support government services as an allowable. The second category for use would be to support COVID-19 public and economic response. Examples of supporting public health response would include COVID-19 mitigation, behavioral health services, medical expenses, and preventing and responding to violence. Addressing the negative impacts involves assistance to households or communities in the form of food, rent or mortgage assistance, job training assistance, or literary assistance. To small businesses and nonprofits, this would come in the forms of loans, grants, technical assistance, and it also allows to increase public sector capacity back to pre-COVID levels and aid impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. The third category is premium pay. This allows pay to salaried workers who are considered essential. The exact quote is needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors. Now the final rule did detail on that, that this cannot be paid to volunteers. It has to be to salaried employees. And last category is to invest in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. This comes in the form of improving sewer treatment plants, improving water quality, transmission, distribution, storage, broadband infrastructure supplying to unserved and underserved communities and households, and modernization of cybersecurity. There are some prohibited expenditures with the ARPA, that includes paying down unfunded pension liabilities, paying on interest and principal of debt, legal settlements, or contributing to rainy day funds. In Brookfield, that would be our general fund. The funds cannot be put into general fund for the sake of merely growing the general fund. So the ARPA ad hoc committee was established last June at the Board of Selectmen meeting. The exact charge was to promulgate possible proposals as well as take input from residents on how to best use federal funds in addressing the long-term effects of the pandemic. As per the Board of Selectmen um, charge, 
This committee consists of members of the Board of Finance, Board of Ed, NBC, Parks and Rec, and Economic Development Commission. These members do not vote. They participated in discussion, evaluations, rankings, and ratings, but not formal votes. In addition to that, we had 10 community members at lunch. This committee has worked for six months, at least twice a month, if not more. It's a bipartisan committee that comes together and collaboratively works with Brookfield's best interests at heart. I'm proud of this committee, proud of the work they've done, and extraordinarily grateful for all of their effort and time. Our actions from August to present, we initially defined the goals, objectives of the committee, and charge of the Board of Selectmen. We then reviewed the interim final rule, the final rule when it came out, and all supporting documentation. We developed our proposal criteria and the evaluation tools associated with that, produced and distributed a survey, hosted a public forum to provide a summary of the ARPA funds and also to garner public input, reviewed and discussed the proposals, evaluated them using our form formal procedure, ranked them, and then ultimately developed and refined the list of recommended proposals that you will see tonight. So the survey I had mentioned went out to um, Brookfield residents. The committee really wanted to find out what, the, what Brookfield residents felt the top priorities were for the direction of these ARPA funds. So the main question we asked was out of this list, what are your top three priorities for direction of these funds? And you can see that out of 272 respondents, the majority of them chose infrastructure and transportation as a top priority, followed very closely behind by public safety and public health, and fourth by economic and workplace development. So the proposals that the committee received were solicited from municipal departments and organizations. The committee received 26 separate proposals Many of them had several items, requests, or sub-proposals. Um, these proposals were received from town departments, commissions, nonprofits, and other organizations. Each proposal was thoroughly discussed by the committee. Pertinent proposals, that is those proposals that the committee felt had allowable uses, allowed by ARPA, or were viable proposals, were moved forward to the rating procedure. The committee then scored these proposals with the established evaluation form, then ranked them via a compilation of evaluation scores and committee priority ranking. So the evaluation tool that I had mentioned is initially consisting of five different criteria that the committee separately and independently ranked each proposal on a scale of zero to 10. Those scores were then averaged and added to get to a total out of 50. Every proposal was then independently rated for how it addressed the COVID-19 impact and that was on a scale of zero to 10. So if we take all the proposals and put them together on a scattergram, the vertical score is our total score out of 50 for the five criteria. The horizontal score is out of 10 and that's how well it addresses the COVID-19 impact. The committee uh, quickly saw those proposals that they considered highest addressing these scores. Those would be the cluster of proposals in your upper right-hand corner that ranked high on both scores. We also realized, though, that there may be proposals of great value that weren't able to rank up there um, because they scored low in one specific area. There may be a, a proposal that had great value to Brookfield but scored very low on addressing COVID-19 impact, or one that perhaps did not have a large breadth of impact, so scored lower there, and therefore brought down its total score. So to address that, the committee then looked at every proposal and independently ranked them on a scale of one to three. One being the ones they felt the highest priority, and two, and three being the lowest. So we then took all three 
of those different ratings. The total score out of 50, the addresses COVID-19 score out of 10, and the average ranking, put them all together and developed the ranking that you see here of all of the proposals. With that, the committee took a look and voted to bring forth the top 12 proposals, which we consider those to be of most value in helping Brookfield recover and beneficial to the community as a whole. These proposals total $2,368,967. Now the committee is very aware that all of this ARPA funding can be put to municipal services. We strongly urge though the Board of Selectmen to consider these proposals as again we do feel they have a high value in helping Brookfield recover and just beneficial to the community as a whole. If we go into each of those proposals and I will just briefly review them, the first one is with the Brookfield Volunteer Fire Department. Um, this is for equipment for both the Volunteer Fire Company and the Candlewood Company. Chief Andy Ellis does an exceptional job justifying every one of these purchases in the proposals, which I did attach as a zip file um, to, your, to the presentation when I sent it. Every proposal is in there if you would like greater detail. But essentially, um, the fire department has seen a 25% increase last year in calls, and as Greg mentioned, even more than that so far for 2022. That has precipitated a greater need for equipment. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has also um, demanded an increase in training and equipment to allow for different protocols and procedures. This amount of money for $375,217 addresses all of those needs. Second on the list is behavioral health case management services. This is a joint proposal by Brookfield Social Services and the Brookfield Police Department with strong support from Brookfield CARES. Full disclosure, I am the chair of Brookfield CARES. And while I did not bring this proposal forward and write it, I did abstain from any discussion, evaluation, rating, or ranking of it. Similarly, any one of our committee members, if they had an involvement or an affiliation, with the department or organization that did submit a proposal, they did likewise and abstain from that discussion and ranking. But this um, proposal addresses the mental health crisis that has uh, precipitated tremendously throughout COVID. There are reports from the CDC that say that depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and substance misuse have almost doubled since the onset of COVID-19. Proposal addresses this mental health crisis with the creation of a clinician position that will collaborate with social services, the police department, schools, businesses, and local agencies to address emerging health issues and then follow up to prevent further crises. They'll put a friendly face to this position and provide workshops that focus on mental health resiliency, decreasing the stigma of mental health, and grief workshops for those that have suffered losses throughout the pandemic. They will also, um, and as importantly, assist in finding resources for those who cannot afford treatment. This proposal is for $200,000 for two years of funding this position. Third is a small business grants proposal proposed by the Brookfield Economic Development Commission. This is for $500,000 for direct grants to be made for small businesses for a maximum of $5,000. This would allow aid to 100 small businesses or more if, if some businesses do not get the full $5,000. Priority focus would be to those small businesses that have not received initial grant monies or those that opened during the pandemic and were not, um, did not meet the criteria for it that way. There would be specific and detailed criteria for businesses to qualify. They would have to be current on all taxes and grant money 
could be used for mitigation tactics, um, increased efforts in cleaning, operations, and also to enhance outdoor spaces, which would increase and expand eating areas. Speaking with Jim Fisher, um, who is the chair of the EDC, he said that there are volunteers on the EDC that would have volunteered to help administer this program. Next is a proposal by the YMCA for membership stipends. This details $50,000 to assist in memberships to Brookfield individuals, families, veterans, and those from low to moderate income levels. This addresses several encouraged uses of the ARPA funds. First is to help prevent the widening of health and educational disparities. The second is to improve the overall health and well-being of the community. And lastly would be to provide relief to the YMCA. They are currently seeing 54% of their pre-COVID membership and provide um, an invaluable partnership with Brookfield. Next is a proposal by the Brookfield Library. I think we can all agree that the library has really stepped up with COVID-19 in their creativity and ingenuity in providing services to the whole community during the pandemic. Their proposal is actually rather modest. It's for $6,000 to provide equipment that will enhance and improve their outdoor programming, which has become extremely popular and necessary during the pandemic. Next is a Brookfield Resident Grant Program. This is a proposal by the ARPA Ad Hoc Committee ourselves to provide $400,000 for assistance to Brookfield residents who are struggling with COVID-related expenses, but who are outside of those that qualify for social service assistance. This assistance might take the uh, form of rent or mortgage assistance, job training, or other aid because the uh, committee realizes that the scope of developing and administering this program is outside of current staffing availability with the town, part of this money would be used to increase staffing to allow that to happen. Next is a proposal for stipends and premium pay for the Brookfield Volunteer Fire Department. This would be for those um, staff and volunteers that have responded to increased calls during elevated hazardous conditions throughout the pandemic, often to great financial and time expense of their own and their families. Premium pay, as I mentioned though, is not allowable to volunteers, which is the majority of the Brookfield Fire Department. So that amount would need to be funded by the lost revenue portion of this grant as it would not be an allowable under the other categories. With the volunteer fire company and the Candlewood company, this premium pay and stipends amounts to $268,500. Next, we have a rooftop air handler, air conditioning unit for the high school media center. The current one is condemned. It's no longer operational. It has used, utilized dated expensive technology, which if they were to try to fix it, 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 it increasingly expensive to repair if they could. The media center cannot be cooled at all now and gets extremely warm during the warmer months. With a new unit, the air ventilation and quality can be greatly enhanced, which is an encouraged use of ARPA funding. The cost for this would be $90,000. Next, we have the Still River Greenway design, which Greg had alluded to. This proposal is by the Still River Greenway Ad Hoc Committee and the Parks and Recreation Department. It is for $250,000 for design to facilitate the expansion of the Still River Greenway North to New Milford, South to Danbury. Um, I, Greg again did a great job explaining how invaluable the Still River Greenway is. It's one of the most used trails in the state. Over 350 people use it a day. And as I had mentioned, there are many more grants for the construction, very few for the design. So this would support the design of the Still River Greenway. Next is a building condition study. 
for the high school in Wiskinger Middle School. This involves $50,000 for a comprehensive building condition study for those two schools with special emphasis on the existing conditions for ventilation and indoor air quality. Again, an encouraged expense of this ARCA funding. In addition, they would look at the age infrastructure um, and compliance so they can further plan for future enrollment needs. Next, we have a public health nurse proposed by the Brookfield Health Department. This position would be to assist in the department's mission primarily just to create a healthy environment for Brookfield residents. This position was recently established and filled, but it is funded by the state through COVID funds only through March. There's a potential to increase that funding for a short time after that. Um, last I had checked, that was still unclear. If it is funded there though, the scope of the position becomes greatly narrowed because the nurse can only address matters dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Funding for this outside of it, the $60,000 to fund the position for two years, would not only ensure that the position stays intact, but would also allow increased capability of what this nurse can do. In other words, working for all public health at Brookfield. And lastly, we have a proposal by the Public Works Department to improve town building accessibility. The list of items suggested uh, by the Public Works is there. All of them work to improve ADA compliance and overall building accessibility. One of the, again, one of the encouraged uses of the ARPA funding is to improve accessibility to both public buildings and health buildings. And um, the volunteer would certainly aid in that. The cost for this is $119,250. So that with that being our top 12, I did want to speak for a moment about an initiative that not only has been introduced within the state, but nationwide. And that is the encouragement to spend 1% of ARPA funding on funding for the arts, with the acknowledgement that arts bring and sustain the vibrancy of a community. Now, unfortunately, none of the proposals for arts made it into our top 12 proposals. So I did want to touch on those four that were submitted with encouragement to the Board of Selectmen to consider those as well. The first is a pocket park sculpture proposed by the Brookfield Arts Commission that Greg did mention as well. $30,000 would be for the purchase and installation of this sculpture. Next would be for paving, roofing, and general maintenance for the Brookfield Playhouse for a total of 58,000. Then we have 200,000 for the Brookfield Craft Center for maintenance and improvement of buildings and or general operating expenses. And lastly, 30,000 for mosaic on the Still River Greenway. So thank you very much um, for entertaining those proposals and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have now. You presented this so wonderfully. Thank you so much. And I just want to say hats off to the entire committee. I mean, what tremendous work, honest to goodness. I remember early on, I came in as a member of the public, and I think you had your whiteboard up, and I was watching you work through your um, goals and your collective, um, uh, I guess, the, the parameters of how you were going to be making your decisions. And I, I knew straight away that you all were going to be a phenomenal, a phenomenal group. So I want to thank everybody. Amazing. Um, I'll start with my list of six quick questions, and it, that being the arts, because right as you said that I had written down what percent of ARPA goes to the arts, and I, and I did recognize that those four items were below the, the, the list of the 12. Um, There's also another one that could... The sewer, right? Exactly. Okay, that was um, my question. Yes, the, with the sewer providing that to uh, Brookfield Craft Center being one of the major uh, points in that area, and then waiving the, um, waiving the fee for the, the craft center, that ask actually could also be considered funding for the arts. Great, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, it's my understanding, and I'm gonna start with this, that that one, for example, it's at the bottom, but again, it goes back to kind of Greg's presentation and what I said earlier about how everything ties in, but my understanding is that amount has 
decreased to 625. So my first question for you is, um, if there's money to be moved around and it's flexible to pot potentially use that somewhere else, that that is something that... That is completely up to the Board of Selectmen. Mm -hmm. Again, everything we put here were only recommendations. They're your recommendations to accept or not accept or change as you all see fit. Okay. This is, these are just the recommendations that the ARPA ad hoc committee is strongly urging that you consider. Thanks. I have five other quick questions. Um, the money that's listed here, is that the dollar amount that was requested per proposal? Or how did this amount come um, to be? For the most part, all of those amounts were directly requested by the proposal. If there was a project and not an amount, I usually went back to the person making the recommendations to see if I could hone in that amount. Um, I realize in further discussion, say, that the amount that for the public health nurse may be a little bit low. I got that number by calling Human Resources um, here and asking what they thought that what they projected that um, position to be, and that was actually before that position was filled and hired. So that may be a little low as well. These, if not exact um, specifications within it, were best guess estimates. Okay. So for the small business grant, um, I appreciate the EDC offering to help. However, how, so with the committee being the ad hoc committee, the work being complete now, um, unless we somehow decide to continue it and move forward, um, potentially this money, this 500K would go to the EDC and then they would establish some kind of a way for people to apply. And do we happen to know how many small businesses didn't receive any aid? Um, I believe Jim might have a better answer to that. And as far as the funding, Marcia might have uh, more insight as to how actually that money would be handled either within the town or the EDC for administration. Okay. So a lot more to follow on that. Um, similarly, with the resident grant, um, I think you noted that there, there would potentially be a paid person right. to allocate this money? The resident grant is actually the vaguest of those grants, and the ad hoc committee realizes it, um, and more so even that we are the one that recommended it. The genesis for this grant was in looking around. We realized that we had almost reached and addressed every population except for perhaps those people that are outside of social services that we don't even know about that are struggling with rent and mortgage and other COVID expenses, whatever they may be. Um, so we generated that amount by guesstimates and just discussion with ourselves, but we also realize that developing the criteria and administering the program is going to take man hours and time and staffing that, that the town doesn't have right now. So we realized that some of that money would have to go to a position to administer that, but we also realized that it would be a finite position because this would only be a one to two year program for people to, to apply to and get funds. Are these people professionals in this area of money allocation or are they contractors or who, who would come up with the determination on which residents would get the money? That again would be up for discussion and determination going forward. Okay. Is ARPA funding allowed for volunteers? Not under the final rule, no. So if that money were to go to that stipend, it would have to go back to the lost revenue section, which you can spend money for operating expenses outside of other allowable uses. So that way it could be worked into the budget or operating expense itself, general services within the town. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have a final point on the public health nurse, and I've, I've said this publicly before, um, and I just want to make, make it clear that, uh, you know, as we look at everything holistically and, and how we're going to move forward, being the town with the second highest debt in the state at $130 million, um, and other towns are doing this, we see the Housatonic Valley region has regionalized their health department. 
and Newtown has as well with Roxbury and Bridgewater. So we're looking at potentially an option, what our options are for re regionalization of our health department. So um, I just wanted to make that point a a as we consider potentially carrying a public health nurse forward. And that would be your all determination to make. We just found it a worthwhile proposal to bring forward to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have a number of questions just for clarification. Um, thank you very much for you and the group. Um, it, it's it's a huge task. Uh, quite frankly, you know, it. it I want to be able to get into this and really, you know, s study what we're going to do with this money. And and I, 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 I you know, right now we're in the middle of this budget, and you know, I would like to. I'm not sure how. It's going to be hard for me to try to go through and and, and uh, get the answers that I want for this and work towards this budget. So I'm going to do as quickly as I can, but it's going to take me a while to get through this and digest it, because again. Um, you know, this is going to be a very involved budget, and we're trying to get started right now. And so, yeah, we have time. It obviously doesn't have to be yeah. spent until 2026. Yeah. Well, we're happy to answer any questions you mm -hmm. have. And, and, and we'll give, I'll get, I'll get you as sure. I go along. And we also included with you the actual proposals, so you mm -hmm. have those to reference as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a great presentation, really, very, very detailed. I really appreciate it. It was a great committee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's tremendous, tremendous work and, and a very, very difficult task. I want to just say that again. But also, um, I don't want to be hasty as a board no. moving forward. No. However, there are certain areas that, you know, that the intent of this money is to address the COVID situation that we've all experienced collectively as a town. So. It is a matter of kind of moving it along and making these decisions and, and making them smartly at the same time. So, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Cliff. Okay. Moving right along. It's going to be a long meeting, ladies and gentlemen. We also have an executive session at the end. So, if anybody needs a break, um, number four, our monthly agenda items. We have a few announcements. The town's budget process is underway, as I've mentioned, Harry just mentioned. The Board of Ed is going to be presenting their budget to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance on Thursday the 10th at 6.30 at the High School Media Center, and it will be live streamed. Our Health Department Vaccine Clinic is only open on Thursdays currently from 3 to 6, as there was not the rush that we saw before. They're still offering both the boosters and the initial vaccinations. Coffee with the community for February will be on the 26th from 9 to 10.30. The public is allowed to come to that, <laughs> just so that you know. <laughs> Harry doesn't have to sit there by himself again? Yes. Uh, and this, this month it will be at the new Brookfield Market in Delhi. And we'd love to see everybody there. The police commission voted to promote Captain uh, Franks to major at their meeting on the 2nd of February. And the Board of Finance appointed Ryan Rudenis as the new member for the duration of the 2022-23 term. We received some correspondence this month from Matthew Grimes, the Planning Commission, WPCA Chairman, Jean Hartnett, and the Library Board of Trustees. Without further ado, our monthly budget update from Marsha. Okay, mine's working now. Um, uh, budget update that we have, um, we're within budget. We're, um, we always do a nice job at that. We try and to move things around as we go along um, because things have change all the time. Um, we are requesting a few budget adjustments um, that um, there are two uh, motions to be made. One is to approve um, the inter 
inter um, inter budget adjustments. That is um, um, money that is going within the the department, um, and that is one thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars going from. Uh, legal notice and advertising up to postage in the selectmen's uh, department. And then we're also asking for um, other transfers um, that are intra-budget in, intra, um, um, transfers that will be going between departments. Um, we have one for a vacation payout. Um, we have uh, legal fees. Um, that um, uh, before this uh, um, firm started, that we had a zoning lawsuit. Um, we didn't. We had cut the um, legal budget way back and had not uh, anticipated that it would cover lawsuits because they're very expensive. Um, our former attorney could not do it, so he is uh, because of a um, conflict of interest. So he had. Um, uh, asked a different attorney to handle it, and their estimate is $21,500. Um, if, of course, that it gets settled before we end, we would only spend what we have to. Um, we have uh, $10,000 on here that we've got more information today, so we're going to ask to just ignore that for now. Uh, the postage um, is the rest of the postage um, for a townwide mailing. Um, we had some wage adjustments and, and changes that we're asking for changes there. And then there's two that we, we, I just want to point out. We're not asking for more money, that we are um, just pointing it out that we think the grants are going to cover them, um, but um, one grant hasn't been calculated yet, one grant hasn't been approved yet, this, this nurse position that we're talking about. Um, so the general fund, if something happens there, which we don't expect, um, uh, may have to backstop that. And I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. That, um, so two budget transfers, one for within the, the departments and one for between the departments. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Moving along to item five, new items. Um, and I don't know if you, usually they would approve the transfers oh, right now, but. Oh, okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the transfers that Marsha addressed. I second it. No question. Any discussion? <laughs> the one thing I did just want to say about the moving the postage around was for the um, right. state of the town. Yeah, that yeah. I haven't decided if I'm going to do every household or not. But. Okay. You just your I, I it would, for me. I yeah. would bring it. Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Police outside services fund request. The police had requested a purchase of drones and other equipment to enhance the response and to have investigative capability of the Brookfield PD as described in their memo that was dated the 5th of January 2022. Make a motion that the selectmen approve and forward a request to the Board of Finance for the appropriation of $15,700 from the Police Department Outside Services Fund for the purchase of these drones and the other associated software and equipment to inaugurate the UAS program within our Brookfield Police Department. I'll second that. Any discussion here? No, just to make sure people understand that, um, you know, this, this will come out of their you know, not, I don't want to say private fund, but they're, they're uh, the police fund and not, not the budget. Anything else? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item B, Police Chief Employment Agreement. I'd like to make a motion that we approve, the selectmen approve the employment agreement between Chief of Police John Puglisi and the Town of Brookfield. I will second that. Discussion? No discussion. All we, in favor? Aye. aye. We had talked with John. John was at an meet, earlier meeting. Oh, he was there. Oh. Hi, John. <laughs> Item C, the police um, major employment agreement 
which is going to newly promoted Major Peter Frangs. I'd like to make a motion that the selectmen approve the employment agreement between Major Frangs and the town of Brookfield. I will second that. Thank you. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This was handled, just maybe want to just let people know this was handled by the police commission. That they uh, had recommended him. That is a fact. Item D, the Housatonic Resources Recovery Authority um, rent space at our old town hall building and their lease with the town expired um, in November of 2021. I'm gonna change the motion here and I'd like to um, make a motion that the selectmen take this um, this item five delta into our executive session tonight. I will second that. Thank you. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And item E, our memorandum of agreement for the parks maintenance workers to be approved. I'd like to make the motion that the selectmen approve the memorandum of agreement between the town of Brookfield and the Brookfield municipal employees the CSEA slash SEIU Local 2001 Chapter 101 CTW. I will second that. Any discussion no on discussion. this one? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And another recommendation on the memorandum of agreement for the highway department. Motion being that the selectmen approve the memorandum of agreement between the town of Brookfield and the Public Works Highway Crew Local 1303-371 of the Council Number 4, AFSCMEAFL-CIO. I will second that. Thank you. Discussion on that? None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There are no updates. So we can go to number seven, our consent agenda. I'd like to make a motion that the selectmen make a motion to approve the items seven alpha through seven delta on this consent agenda. I will say there was a misnumbering further down. So it's seven alpha through seven delta. And then we'll move to number eight additional monthly agenda items. And I will second that with no Thank you. questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number eight, additional monthly agenda items. Everybody is privy to see the budget um, calendar with the attachment on the website. Right. Would you like me to make a recommendation? The number two, recommend a motion? Sure. Okay, Thanks. Lusitanic Resource uh, Recovery Authority, recommend a motion that the selectmen uh, make a motion to appoint first select woman, Tara Carr, as a representative to the HRRA for a term expiring on 12 4 23. Can I vote on that? Yeah. I second that. I believe she can. Yeah, I believe you can. Can I vote on that one? Yeah. I have no questions. <laughs> I don't either. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> that would be the two of us. Three, the Land Use Enforcement Officer appointment. I'd like to make a motion that we, the selectmen, appoint Rochelle Hodza as the Land Use Enforcement Officer, which includes erosion, sedimentation, wetlands enforcement for a term expiring on February 6, 2024. I will second that. No questions. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Planning and Zoning Officer appointment make a recommendation that the selectmen make a motion to appoint Francis Lolly as a planning and zoning officer for a term expiring 6 February 2024. I will second that with no question. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. For number five, the Democratic Town Committee appointment recommendations. I am changing this first recommendation that the selectmen make a motion to table Frank Kwok as an alternate on the zoning commission alternate for term of 7 February 2022 through 2 February 2026. I will second that. Any discussion? I, would you like to maybe just give a 
Um, just that the the RTC Zoning Commission has appointed someone else, and the board um, needs more time for consideration on this item. That's all. Okay, I, I'll say that's okay. I just all in favor. Aye. I aye. just thought it would be good to just give a quick. And that's what happened. On the second item, the selectmen make a motion to appoint Bunny Tessier Mensinger to fill a vacancy on the Arts Commission for the term 7 February 2022 through 5 February 2024 as recommended by the DTC. I will second that. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And number six, the Republican Town Committee recommendations for reappointments. Terms ending 2-7-2022, like to make a motion to reappoint the following individuals. Loretta Ball, James Sullivan, Paul Checo, Josh Flowers, Bill Perrone, William Lohan, Steve Harding Sr., Nancy Power, Rosemary Fawcett, John Donovan, David Frankel, Alice Carolyn, Paul Checo, Robert Giannaza, Renee Santiago, George Blass, Richard Hore, Ryan Murphy, Nelson Malowitz, Gerald Giacobone and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Minus the last one. I will second that. Thank with no you. questions. Is, is that really through today? The 2 7 2022? Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 end ended, ended, they end today. today, so they'll be through. So now they're usually four years. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, these are the new recommendations for the new term. Number seven, I'd like to make a motion that the selectmen make a motion to rescind the appointment of Leanna Hanger uh, as on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I will second that. Thanks. All in favor or discussion? I, yeah, I have no discussion. Thank I'm you. aware of the situation. Uh, yes. Aye. Aye. And number eight. I'd like to make a motion that the selectmen appoint Robert Lovell from alternate to regular member on the police commission to fill a vacancy for the term today through 5 February 2024. I will second that. Discussion? With no question or discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next item is public comment. Do we have anybody? No, no, I'm probably going into executive session. She has public comment and then. Oh, I'm sorry. Session. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I flipped the page too quick. It's three minutes tonight. Thank you. Laura Orban, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Laura Orban, 95 Stony Hill Road. The following can be verified through public record. Ms. Carr, on Wednesday, December 15th, your eighth business day in office, you called a special meeting of the Board of Selectmen to replace Tom Beecher of Collins Hannafin as town attorney with Dennis Coconos of Marino Zabel, where Themis Claritas is a partner. Tom Beecher served our town under multiple administrations of both political affiliations. You made this replacement with no RFP. On Monday, January 10th, Thomas Devonzo resigned from the Board of Finance. Town Charter, Section C2-6, dictates that the Board of Finance fills its own vacancy and is silent on affiliation. In a departure from the guidance given by Tom Beecher, as well as decades of precedence, you directed the Board of Finance that this spot must be filled with a Republican. On Monday, January 17th, Robert Marconi, a Democrat, resigned from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Town Charter Section C4-12 dictates that the Board of Selectmen filled this, fills this vacancy, quote, by the appointment of a member of the same political party. At a special meeting of the Board of Selectmen on January 27th, you appointed Leanna Hinger, a Republican, to that spot. When I contacted you regarding this violation of the charter, you blamed the error on the Republican Town Committee. You copied RTC Chair George Blass, who offered three explanations. Over the weekend of January 22nd, you attended six basketball games, at least three of which were in Brookfield Public Schools, where masks are required did not wear a mask at any of those games. In the News Times article of January 24th, you acknowledged the mask mandate, but stated that masks are not, in, that mandates are not enforceable. 
Your explanations included other adults not wearing masks, children wearing masks improperly, and no one asking you to wear a mask. So let me connect the dots. One, you failed to follow transparent and best practices when replacing Tom Beecher with Dennis Kokonos as the town attorney. Second, you and the new town attorney then gave the Board of Finance a partisan interpretation of the town charter it's when it been came three minutes, Mrs. Orban. I'm almost done. When it came to the Board of Finance vacancy. Third, you violated the charter with your zoning board of appeals appointment. You were either unaware of who you were appointing to what seat, you're taking direction from the Republican Town Committee Chair George Blass, or you tried to take a seat on a town board. Maybe some combination of the three. And finally, you demonstrated that you're proud of following only the rules you agree with and only when someone is there to enforce them. Thank, Thank you for you. your comment. Is there anyone else from the public? Nelson Malwitz. Thank you. Stiff there, staying all the time. Um, Nelson Malwitz of One Great Heron Lane in Brookfield. I want to acknowledge the good work that Colette did in the ARPA study. Uh, I want to also point out that the, uh, the survey that was done um, indicated that people were interested in infrastructure, public safety, and public health uh, matters. And um, the matter of the sewers at the Brookfield market area, which includes nine properties, uh, comes in that category of infrastructure, public safety, and public health. And uh, it was recommended by the town uh, health director and the sanitarium that we address those issues. They're longstanding. They're in the town center district. It's an important area. We've talked about it at length, the town center district. And um, but this is an environmental and health and safety issue that um, probably should be addressed. The, um, in the analysis of the use of the funds, uh, the, that project um, well, that project was put in with all the others, and sewer, water, and broadband, so those infrastructure things were specifically, did not have to be um, COVID-19 related. So it was in the mix and probably should have been separated out in some way. Um, and so anyway, um, this is a longstanding issue and the WPCA has worked hard We've uh, uh, to uh, do, do a design. We've done quite a bit of uh, value engineering in order to get the price down to be the, mo the minimum and most effective. And uh, so th the best we can do for the proposal was $620,000 can't be afforded by the nine properties that are there. So uh, the grant of uh, the ARPA, uh, at least the initial guidelines were uh, sewer infrastructure didn't have to be, could be just addressed without regard to uh, COVID-19. And so anyway, I'm just urging that as a consideration. And um, the other thing, it's a little bit um, sort of puzzling, and I'm sure there's an answer for it, but those those numbers told up to about $2.4 million roughly, and the town was granted $5 million. And so there's another half of a pie to take care of it. We would even take the second half of the pie. <laughs> and and uh, and use it and, and build it in the meantime on the promise that it would come. So that's my comment. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ines. All right, Andy King. Oh, I got it. I have it. Okay. Hi, thank you. Andy King, Five Fernbrook Drive. Um, I guess uh, my first question is uh, regarding the police outside service fund request for the drones. Um, it sounds to me like um, drone surveillance is being approved for Brookfield citizens. So I would hope that there would be some additional explanation on that at some point. Um, I have a couple other things. Um, regarding the streetscape and four corners, one of the things I, uh, I appreciate the presentation. It was very comprehensive and a lot of work's going into it. And uh, kudos to all those folks. The one thing I did notice that seemed to be missing was uh, once we put this entire structure in place, it's going to go on for a, for a lengthy period of time, probably forever. And I don't see any cost regarding maintenance there. Um, some other towns, when they have developers do these things, one of the things that happens is developers pay for the impact to the community. Um, that would be nice if we knew what that was. So long term, what are the additional costs going to be? And how does that relate to the income that we're deriving from all of these things? I'm basically looking for a cost-benefit analysis there. Are Brookfield citizens going to have to share this, these costs going forward, or how, how will that work, and what are those costs? I'd also like to know the size of the pocket park. 
nobody seems to mention that is that the small area that's outside the dunkin donuts where the hearth sign used to be because that really benefits primarily that building it's really that park is really too small to use for anything other than maybe a bench or two and then i think somebody needs to be objecting to some of these low income housing analysis it's really very unfair to be lumping bethel and brookfield in with stanford gary ann uh, stanford uh, norwalk those are cities that have massive housing projects uh, 40 stories and if i used to work in stanford and i also worked in north you know thousands of people in these buildings in these projects uh, it, that's not really an apples to apples comparison to compare a suburban town like Brookfield to Stanford. So um, I would ask that, is there some way to push back on that? Um, the other thing is, I'm not, I'm not, I keep hearing about this $800,000 sewer hookup for the four corner section. And my understanding is that when the average citizen hooks up with the WPCA, there's a bonding component for that. So in other words, if I had a building and I was going to be hooking up to the sewer, there would be a bond that I would take out and I would pay over a period of time to amortize those costs. Is that same process available to the Four Corners folks? And um, my last question is, was there any luck on clawing back some of the 30000 that was allocated for the new library study after the um, citizens voted down that proposal that they didn't want to go with the new library? I, I think there was a lot of talk last at last meeting and the general consensus was that that was really not what it was going for it was going for something else so you know we're telling the citizens that it's one thing but it's really something else and the bottom line is, is i don't think it should have been spent period thank you and that's thank, thank you and that's all i have and thank you for all the work you're doing mr walker Hi, George Walker, um, 24 Little and Ona Drive here in Brookfield. Just a, a quick question that in reviewing and preparing uh, myself for reading through the documentation for tonight's meeting and everything, I did come across the WPCA letter uh, dated January 31st that's adjusted or that's attached to your documentation. And uh, just playing around with some numbers and just to play off a little bit with the prior speaker's notes there is that uh, this $800,000 for that uh, uh, Four Corners area over there on the east side of the river uh, amounts to, uh, and I don't know which, it, the cost specifically for each one of the nine properties is 90, just an average, $92,000 per property. And I want to make sure that, and there is, and in the letter, there is a dis discussion in here about the property owners being assessed. But I'm not so sure that they really have that much skin in the game. Let's put it that way, okay? If the taxpayers and all these grants and all this other money is going to make up on that $800,000, and each property, if you average it out, comes out to about $29,000 per property versus the cost of $92,000. That's a huge amount of money that's going back to potentially the, the bonding and the taxpayers and, and the grants and all that sort of thing. So, you know, as you, get, as you dig down and you drill into these numbers, this is pretty high. And this has to be, I think, very carefully reviewed and assessed and is it worth it I, I you know i'm not going to sit here tonight and say it isn't worth it because it probably is but those properties hopefully increase in value but we're spending 90 or the, the cost is ninety two thousand dollars per property and that is a lot of money the other thing that if as the average house uh person that hooks up to a sewer, they pay typically an assessment over a certain period of time. And I do know that I'm involved in the commercial side of the business, that my commercial clients, when they hook up to our sewers, that they have to pay for their hookups. 
from the building out to the line. The total cost there is uh, the total cost of this project is, from what I can see, it's going right to the property, right into the property, including the hookups. I believe that's the case, and Nelson probably might be able to answer that. I'm not quite sure. Okay, so. Um, you know, there's a bunch of pump stations that are in here and that sort of thing. Very costly. I want to make that point. It needs to be evaluated very carefully. Thank you. Thank you, George. I think that I mentioned earlier the cost on that has lessened to, from 800k to 625. Next speaker is Andy Ellis. Good evening. I'm Andrew Ellis. I'm the fire chief in town. Uh, one of the fire chiefs. Um, just making everyone aware tonight, I, I watched, uh, we had our company meeting, I had my earpiece in watching you guys um, do the presentation for ARPA and Greg's great presentation on the streetscape. Um, just letting everyone know um, uh, the effect that all this growth has had on the uh, emergency services in town. Um, I've had several meetings over the last couple of weeks with um, uh, Tara and Marsha and the Board of Selectmen and talked to the Board of Finance. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of increases for serve requests for service for the fire department and the ambulance. Um, a lot uh, to do with the commercial growth uh, in town here, uh, especially the multifamily houses. Um, for example, the 30, 40, 50 Laurel Hill Road over the last four years, we've had um, 117 requests for an ambulance there and 76 requests for the fire department just in those three buildings alone. Uh, I have seen since 2017, a 44% increase in fire calls. We have an all-volunteer fire department. And I've seen a 28% increase in EMS calls. Uh, this year alone uh, went from um, to almost 2,000 calls. The first, um, up till today, we're up to 232 calls for the, the year. Last year, we were at 163. So I'm, I'm seeing a 34% increase already this year. All right, and it's not COVID-related, it's just general requests for service. Um, the fire department um, is at 118 percent increase for calls. Um, Goodbye. 994 calls um, for the month of January, as compared to 43 last year. Um, so we are seeing an increase. And, and to Mr. Kane's um, uh, comment about impact studies, um, all of this development has a profound impact on emergency services, uh, and we have, you know, requested some some significant uh, increases in our staffing uh, to keep up with what's going on. And, and uh, we just wanted to... Andy, can you hold on? Sure, you got it. That goodbye was us losing the conference room. Losing we, the conference room. The people watching out, outside do not have audio from us anymore from Zoom. Okay. Okay, we'll hold on. Uh, let's see. Turn back on meeting on your screen. Is the remote still up there? Yeah. My screen kept clicking around because the remote was hitting something on it. There you go. I think you might have accidentally entered our immediate. Oh, boy. <laughs> nice job, Chief. Hey, you know, it's been a long day. No emergency here. Yeah. Uh, Somebody had me at 830 in the meeting. I see. Uh, let's see. I just got to get us connected from here then. Yeah. We, we are. We have increased our stuff. Yeah. Yep. And we're actually, actually July, we got a it's, it's never seen numbers like that. No. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your participant ID followed. Okay, Andy. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Um, so I just basically wanted to just go on record. Um, we do, you know, sometimes we don't get that our message out there, and sometimes people are surprised, you know, why I see a large increase in our budget or what's going on. It, the numbers are real, and, and it is driven by the growth of this town. Um, so all these projects are great, and I think it's wonderful for this town, but it has a, an effect on emergency services, the fire department and the ambulance in particular. And there are costs involved with that. And that needs to be, you know, brought to light so everyone's aware 
uh, of what's going on and, and what we need uh, to continue to operate to provide emergency services for the town. So I just want everyone to be aware. Um, you know, I, I think Greg's did a great presentation and, and he's been really good uh, letting us know ahead of time what's going on, to keep us involved with trends and, and, and increasing manpower and things. Um, but we unfortunately we have some more of those increases coming. And I just wanted everyone to be aware um, that there is an effect on emergency services. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief Ellis. You. Is there any further public comment? Oh, no, none. I'm here. Jay, Sorry, are you speaking? That's okay, Jay. Jay Annis. Jay Annis, 12 Kimberly Drive. I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank both Greg and Colette for their work. I uh, wanted to reiterate the fact that uh, I have worked with Greg uh, quite a bit on streetscape options, and the option in Streetscape 6 is the best option that we can come up with our committee in conjunction with um, Greg. I'd like to thank Colette for recommend her committee recommending the design, and I just wanted to give you an idea of why that's so important. Uh, as Greg mentioned, there are very limited funds for design uh, available in grants. The most recent one was uh, prepared, was offered by DEEP, the State uh, Department of Environmental and Energy Protection, and that was the first DEEP grant available in two years, and it was only for $3 million. They received 31 project requests for over $8 million. So there's certainly no guarantee that even if money comes available in the near future, that we're going to get it. And so uh, the recommendation of using the ARPA money to fund the design study would finally get us moving after two and a half years. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Jim Fisher, 12 Airmont Circle. I would just like to thank Greg and Colette for uh, fantastic presentations. Um, one thing I would say about the, the ARPA funds is that, I th and I was on the committee. Um, I was representing the EDC. I'm the EDC chair. I think one of the things we did, we wanted to be realistic with what we were presenting to the town. Now I, I'm only speaking for myself. And I think by presenting, some, someone pointed out the numbers were it only added up to 2, 5 or something we presented. We were originally charged with thinking the town was going to take approximately 1-9. That left us 3-1. And I think by proposing 2.5 million, that's almost doubling what we're giving to, well, we're not giving to the town, but we're suggesting, we're saying, or in my mind, we're saying to the town, look, here's the, the 12 things we really think are important. There's, other, there's a lot of important things going on. But those 12 things should really be addressed or related to COVID. And then that way, we're still giving the town two and a half million, three million dollars, whatever it is, the number, that we're saying, look, there's a, so many good things that has to be done for the town that, and there's projects that are listed, the sewer at the, uh, up at the four corners being one of them that's drastically expensive. But if that sewer might not get made, what's gonna happen to all those buildings right there? It's gonna be a huge night, it already is a nightmare. So. I'm hoping that between the monies we've recommended and the money the town has that a lot of these things will get funded. And I will just say one other thing about the fire department. I don't think the town can do enough for the volunteer fire department. Um, there was concern about the siphons for the volunteers. I don't know how you work it out legally, but between the town attorney and everybody involved, I recommend, strongly recommend the siphons get paid to the volunteers and the EMTs. I mean, they're the ones who had to answer the, you know, the phone call when, oh, you got to pick up my mom, she's got COVID. You know, nobody in town hall was going to get her unless they were a volunteer. But I mean, we can't, I don't think we can do enough for the fire department. So I would really like to see them get those stipends no matter how it's done, whether it comes out from the town's money or the rainy day fund or whatever, but that should be funded. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? That's, I love seeing everybody here. This is great. And now we're going to break. I'd like to make a motion that the selectmen vote to go into executive session to discuss with the town attorney documents exempt to CGS section 1 206 and or to discuss attorney client privilege information as set forth in CGS section 1 210 10 relating to the following. 
and invite the town attorney, recording secretary Ginny, into executive session. Can I? I will get second that. Second. Thank you, Harry. Aye. All in favor. Aye. Second. Thank you for coming. Hey, Nelson, um, are you, we just are you stay here? I, I have some questions. Are you, are you just quiet during the day, or? Um,
Oh, Dan's here. I'm calling you. Oh, God. <laughs> Everybody left for the day, huh? Goodbye. Oh, my laptop just died. <laughs> you, well, knew YouTube getting, is up. you knew it was getting close. Yeah. The YouTube is up. We had a few people still watching there at the closing. <laughs> There's so many good shows on Netflix. I know. <laughs> All right, well, the laptop didn't make it, so the two people that might have been sitting on yeah. Zoom are gone. But, uh, Can you still be coming? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All right, so you're ready to go for any sort of recording you need to do? Yes. Thank you. Do I have any questions about this? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to make a motion bringing us back into regular session of our Board of Selectmen meeting. I will second that. Thank you. Discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 And finally for the evening, I'd like to um, set four separate motions. The first motion pertaining to 8 Nabby Road. The lease will be expiring on March 31st, 2023. Yeah. And I'd like to make a motion to increase the rent from $1,325 to $1,600 per month. I will second that. I'm not done with my motion. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. And this motion being contingent on the town attorney confirming that there is nothing precluding this increase due to uh, state housing authorities and also contingent on it being approved for 8-24 referral through our zoning. This will be a one-year rent for Again, the term 1 April 2022 through March 31st, 2023. I will second that. Any discussion? None. Thank you all in favor? Aye. Aye. The next property I'd like to set, uh, what do I want to do? I want uh, to make it. a motion to approve the 43 Silver Mine Road lease, which will expire on the 14th of February, 2022. And we will keep that rent at 1750 uh, contingent on this property going through zoning for 8-24 referral. And the terms of the lease will be 15 February, 2022 through 14 February, 2023. I will second that with no questions or discussion. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to make a motion that we review the lease for 28 Obtuse Hill Road closer to the terms of the lease in the fall being one October 2022 for a possible increase at that time. I will second that with no discussion or questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And finally, for the rent of uh, the space by HRRA, I'd like to make a motion that we table the decision on any potential rental increase for the HRR space until next month. I will second that with no discussion. And I can just interject, Jenny did provide me that lease last week. I just did not have an opportunity to, read it, to review it in full, so I'll do that for the next meeting. And I'll also endeavor to reach out to the tenant um, to speak to her directly about what needs and issues she may have and report back to, to the board next month. Thank you. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And finally, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I will second that with no questions. And I want to thank Jimmy as yes. part of the discussion there. And Dan, of course, all these late nights, but uh, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you.